Daddy, Lord, my God, come before you this morning, King of glory, ancient of days, on this day of worship, Father, Lord God Almighty, that we have set aside for you, in the name of Jesus, my Lord and my God, we pray that you come and take your place, you come and take the earth, you come and take control, you come and take, oh my God, absolute control, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, as we go before you this morning, to study your word, to search the scriptures, my Lord and my God, I pray, oh God Almighty, that you will open up our hearts, oh God, to receive the word that you have for us this morning, you will come and be our teacher, Lord God Almighty, let everyone who is teaching here today, Father Lord, in the discipleship class, and also in the world, Father Lord, my God, let everyone be Increase and let you increase in the name of Jesus Christ. Let your word, the word of God Almighty, come forth with power, come forth with might and with strength in the name of Jesus Christ. Fill with the Holy Ghost power in the mighty name of Jesus, so that your it will penetrate into the hearts, uh, even into the hearts of the viewers. It will penetrate, Lord God, uh, and something new will happen today in somebody's life. Uh, somebody will give their life to Jesus Christ. Somebody will de- rededicate their life to Jesus Christ. Somebody will go up higher in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory and the honor. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Over to you, over to you, sir, Abra Chooks. God bless you, man of God. You are welcome. Go ahead. Can, can everybody hear me clearly? Am I very clear? As in, is my voice audible? Uh, yes, audible? Your, your voice is audible. It's a little bit... Um, helpful. I can hear you. Go ahead, sir. Might be my network. Okay. Okay. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right. I bless the name of God for this opportunity He has given me this day, and uh, I know that God has set aside this topic He laid in my heart to bless us richly. So I want. One of us here. To... Maybe you are still a small believer. That's why you have to be discipled. In fact, I'm going to speak to my brother. We have to call this like Sunday school so that some people will not think it's just maybe for some little people that are just coming in. And then, so they will come in after. Uh, so it's not supposed to be. Everybody's supposed to be present here. So, uh, Holy Spirit of God, I thank you for everything. We ask that you speak. We ask that you teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so what we have here today, uh, with the list of topics I was given, I, the Spirit of God helped me and I was able to pick uh, the topic, persevering in the face of trials, temptations, and persecution. In fact, when I saw this topic, I said, my spirit was strongly drawn to this to- towards this topic. And then I looked at it, I said, what does God actually want me to say? This preaching or this uh, teaching this morning, this is not necessarily a preaching. In the sense that if someone is not born again, he might not really enjoy this because we will not be saying repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. This is like a, 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 a silent, trying to trying to plaster a, a deal with somebody that has come into the body of Christ, and then this teaching is what to build up 
or structure. So when we say persevering in the face of trials, temptation, and persecution, what is persevering? The picture of persevering is like a marathon race, whereby you have to run a long distance. It's not like the 100 meters race or the uh, 200 meters race, whereby you run. Those people who have enough stamina or perhaps people who have much muscles can easily win the race of 100 meters, and 200 meters, but those you don't you don't see with the boats taking part in a marathon race because it needs somebody who can endure. It needs somebody who can run a longer distance. So this heavenly race is actually used here to make us understand that it is something that perhaps uh, some for some people it might take five years, it might take six years, it might take ten years, it might take twenty years. And now, what are we to persevere about? So perseverance means to persist, to continue steadfastly in pursuit of a particular task. Perhaps in spite of distractions, in spite of difficulties, in spite of challenges or obstacles of whatsoever measure, persevering. So in the context of today's topics, what are we to persevere? We are to persevere in the face of trials, temptations, and persecutions. I just hope the time given will be able to consume this thing because, in fact, if I was just giving the topic persevering in the face of trials, we can exhaust one hour talking about perseverance in the face of trial. How much more now talking about in the face of trials, in the face of temptation? In the face, I just, if, please, if it's 15 minutes to the time, if it's 15 minutes to one, please let me know so that we'll give uh, opportunity for questions and answers. So whichever area I did not touch, Perhaps if I'm giving the opportunity some other time, we'll be able to speak about it. But we must understand what we have here instead of rushing through the whole lot. So uh, when we talk about trials, trials, in one word, the test. And then temptation, perhaps you can also say the trial. So that's why the Greek word, there's a Greek word that combines these two uh, words, trials and temptation. The Greek word is pierazo, pierazo. And it has a dual meaning. It can either mean a test or to tempt. To test or to tempt. So in the, the Greek words, uh, the, the, the Bible was, the New Testament was written in Greek and then was translated in English. So if you read the Greek uh, New Testament uh, Bible, you will see the uh, Pierazo, Pierazo, in all those places, you see trials and temptations, trials, temptations. But the context to which it's being used is what determines what it means. So when it's, when it's speaking about God's hand upon our lives, it's talking about trials. When it's speaking about the devil trying to do one or two things. So there's a negative part of it. There's a positive part of it. So uh, when we, uh, let's start with trials. Trials, what's trials all about? So when, if you use your concordance and try to browse through scriptures to look at what trials are all about, in King James Version, you see trials about six times. Two in the Old Testament, and four in the New Testament. And what does that tell us? That in this New Testament, you and me, in this New Testament, the church dispensation, our trial is going to be two times that of the Old Testament. Our trials, our temptations, our persecutions will be twice what we heard of in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when the trial, one of the, one of the places where trial was found, Job 9.23, where we was talking about Job and Stomach, who? Who could have believed that God would do so much? Because Job, the law wasn't there. I think Job would be one of the first scriptures written because the law of Moses wasn't mentioned. It wasn't as if he was, he was obeying any law. So he had no Bible like you and me. But God was able to put him through severe tests. Severe tests. And in fact, I've not seen it. There was no other Old Testament person who suffered as much as Job suffered. And many of us know of the story. So we would not spend so much time in it. And also another place, uh, the trial that the Israelites went through, how God tested them day after day, day after day. And then in the New Testament, it is little all around. All the disciples, even Jesus himself, who was to lead us into this new covenant, had to go through trials from his childbirth, had to be born in a, in a, in a, in a very poor home, how to be, had to, perhaps they lived in a very small room, and they, four or five children in a small room with the father and mother, and the father and mother, they were not new covenant people, so they must have been a time where they fought with each other, where they argued, because you don't expect them to have been saints, because they just gave it to Jesus. 
or Mary because she was given the opportunity to give birth to Jesus. You do not expect that uh, she was so saintly that she did not misbehave. No, Jesus had to pass through so much with his parents. So some of these things and sometimes starvation, no food, no water, the scripture did not make us understand this thing. But if you are in the spirit, it will make you see that he went through much more in his 30 years than he ever went through in his three and a half years. He went through much more. Sometimes people will see him on the road playing football. They say, oh, look at this bastard. Were they right or wrong? His mom did not sleep with his dad before giving birth to him. So how can you explain to somebody? You are telling, okay, did, your, did Joseph sleep with Mary before giving birth to him? He said, no, but, but it was the Holy You cannot explain it. You can, if only if it happens to you today and somebody told you, if the Holy Spirit impregnated me, you still laugh. You say, it's only once, it's only once. So they did not have the interpretation of scripture just like you and me today. So just, it's just a little picture of the trials that Jesus must have faced. And what, why is trials necessary? When we look at, let me, let, me, let me use another picture of a goldsmith. When you go to that place, you see that the gold has to go through so much of fire. It has to be put in a furnace and the temperature has to be increased to thousands or hundreds of degrees Celsius. Why does this have to, why do you have to put the gold through such? Why don't you just mine it, dig it into the ground, bring out the gold, clean it up, and then, no. See, there is a difference between innocence and holiness. Adam was holy. Adam was innocent but was not holy. For a person to transcend from being innocent to holiness, he must be tested. For I to endow you with power, for, I, for, for myself, for, for me to be able to give you some, some preference, for me to be able to give you some, some glory, some, some reward, I must test you, I must pass you through. For you to even appear to be like me in any form, I must test you, you must pass through. So that was why God allowed uh, Adam and Eve to go through the test, but they failed. And all through from Adam, looking at Cain, he tested them with their gifts. What offering are you going to bring from, to me? And Cain brought a wrong one. Uh, Abel brought a right one. So from Adam, the first man, up to the last man before rapture comes, God will keep testing us. So you see that this gold is inside that place. Before, before the gold goes into the fire, it has little or no value. In fact, because of the much impurity it has, with its lead and so many other uh, elements attached to this gold, and forms a compound. So you have to put it into the fire and allow the fire to consume, to keep burning and melt it. And then these impurities, they float to the top. And then you are able to scoop these impurities off the surface. And then you put the gold into uh, the fire again. You keep, you keep hitting, you keep hitting. The impurities flow to the top. That is how God is treating us. So who is, the, who is, who, who is in charge of trials? Who is in charge of testing? God is in charge of this work. God is working in our lives. So sometimes when you see terrible things happening in your life, when you see so much trouble in your family, what is God doing? God is putting you in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the furnace, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There where they were, he was purifying them. That was why Jesus was present. So God was, God, God, the, the goldsmith puts this gold into the fire. It melts it. Sometimes the trouble you face, it melts you. In your secret place, it makes you cry. It makes you feel so bad. It makes you feel disturbed. It makes you feel, God, why am I praying day and night? And these things are still hammering me. This, I'm still going through this terrible situation. The same thing the God is crying all about. Please take me out of this fire. Take me out of this furnace. But God is saying, no, wait, wait. And then when they bring out the gold, they test it. Ten karat gold. No, it's not pure enough. It's not pure enough. They put it in the fire again. Tough. That's in. 14 karat gold. The gold says, please, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Take me out of this fire. I said, no, I know the work I want to do in your life. Till it gets to 24 karat gold, you don't bring the gold out of the fire. If not, you sell it for a very cheap amount. Very, very less quality. So that is the work God is doing in the life of every Christian. Everyone who has become born again, the next step is that God has to pass you through fire. Many Christians, when they come into the fold, they just believe oh, it's all about grace. Jesus paid the price for us. He was sick so that we would never be sick. He was poor so that we would always be rich. He, he went through this. He went through fire so that we would never go through fire so that our Christian race would be very smooth. I tell you, that is a lie. 
So my brothers and my sisters, God is charging us this morning. And he's telling us, whatsoever you are seeing in your life, whatsoever trouble, no, don't, no, then cannot go down. But then cannot go is not pure. The Lord wants to make you the best of what he can make you. So what's, what's, the, what's the aim? So let's, let's just go to the scripture. One, uh, First Peter, chapter 4. You see the verse 12. I'll read quickly. If you're not able to get it, just note those scriptures down so that uh, later on you'll go pick them up. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the very trial which is to try you. Beloved, that is to say somebody, a brother, a sister, somebody in the same fold. So whenever Paul wanted to speak to Christians or whenever Peter or any of the apostles wanted to speak to Christians, he said, beloved. So beloved, think it not strange. Let it not be something strange when you see yourself going through a particular sickness over and over again. Let it not come into your mind and say, perhaps I've, I've committed a particular sin. Why am I so poor? Or why, why is this situation in my family so lingering? He said, think it not strange. Don't let it surprise you. Don't let it baffle you. Think it not strange. Concerning the fairy trial, the difference between trial and fairy trial. Fairy trial is immense. More, more, more trying, more, more, more. In fact, if, if, if the fire is 20,000 degrees, it's now increasing it to about 6,000 degrees. Think it not strange when it comes to you. Because it is going to come. It does, it does not say it might come to some people and will not come to some others. If you are a Christian, the Lord must put you through some measures of trial. Take it or leave it. So why is he doing this? He said, uh, do not, I continue, he said, as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. Christ suffered. Are we supposed to partake in his suffering or just to enter into his promise? and to enjoy all the goodies that Jesus has paid for us and all the price he has paid. We just enjoy all the money and enjoy all the peace and enjoy all the things on it. He said, no, you are to partake in this suffering that when his glory is revealed, that he may be glad and also exceedingly joyous. So one of the reasons also in First Peter chapter 1, verse 7, he said that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold. I just described how gold is being purified in fire, an intense refining process. And I've made us to understand that the person who is, the refiner who is putting this gold in the fire does not hate this gold. In fact, he wants to bring the best out of this gold. So when it's 10 karat gold and the gold is screaming, please take me out of this fire. When it's 14 karat gold, please take me out of this fire. It's enough, I want you to try it enough, I want I done enough. Please, please, it is time to take me out. The gold, he said, no. The refiner says, no, 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 no. It's not time. It has to be 24 karat. So now he said, we are much more precious than gold that perishes. Through it may be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So why is God trying us? So that we would be found with praise and honor and glory at his appearing. So that we would glorify Jesus, so that we have the glory of Jesus, so that we would look like Jesus. Also, another illustration, when you go to, the, just try one of these days, go to this uh, silversmith. I just explained the goldsmith. Go to the silversmith. The silversmith has to put the silver in the furnace and sit there, just like Malachi chapter 3, 2 and 3. When you go home, you read it. You see that the silversmith has to sit down and keep his eyes fixed in the furnace, looking at this silver, and the silver is burning and burning and burning, all the impurities are going away, he has to sit down there, and he has to keep observing. Why does he have to sit down there? Because any moment, if the temperature or if the heating becomes one minute more than it's supposed to be, the silver will be destroyed. The same thing in your life, in my life. If God puts his eyes off you, one moment, I tell you, you are not going to perhaps will be destroyed in such troubles and such uh, persecution that we are facing and such trial that we are facing. But the reason why God, it only shows us, it only proves to us that God's eyes are just focused on us. We would not spend one minute extra out of, in that trial we are facing. In that trial you are facing, in that sickness, in that, uh, no matter, financial trials, or this or that family or whatsoever, you would not spend one minute more than you is expected because God knows it will destroy you. 
is that is the reason why in First Corinthians chapter ten verse thirteen he said, "I would, I though I'm not the one that tempted you, but I would not allow you this temptation to be above you. Rather, when you are in it, I will bring you out of it because I know it might destroy you." So the silver smith has to sit down there and keep his eyes fixed. God's eyes are fixed on you and me. In fact, he has the number of the hairs of your head. And he's looking at you and he's seeing you in that circumstance and he's seeing you in that trouble and he cares about you. He wants you to understand that he is sitting down and his eyes are fixed on this furnace. You are in this world and the world is so hot over you and everything around you is like, at least every one of us has one or two things that we have been bothered about. So that's why God is speaking to us through this word. And no matter how intense that fire may be, his eyes are fixed. Because if, it's, if he lets you stay in that fire one more minute than expected, he knows you'll be destroyed. So he will make sure that he keeps his eyes on you. And why is he doing that? The, when, when a silversmith was asked, he said, please, so why are you doing that? How do you know that the time is up for this fire to keep consuming? How do, how do you know that the, the, the silver has been purified? He says, when I see my glory, I see my image. The image of the refiner has to appear in the silver before. That's when you will know that it is time to quench the fire. Until Jesus begins to see his glory in your life. Until Jesus begins to see his glory in my life. He would not stop trying us. And when we become like Jesus, when he comes, so throw out your stay on earth, he will keep trying you. He will keep trying us. He will keep trying you. So daughter of Zion, son of Zion, do not be troubled. Do not be tired of that fire. Do not try to come out when you are just 10 carats gold. Do not try to come out of that fire when you are just 14 carats. God wants to glorify us. God wants to make us exactly like Jesus. Just like the silver smith is saying, I want to see my image in that silver. That is why I'm leaving it in this fire. God wants to see his image in you. That is why he's leaving you in that fire. So God is also, another reason why God is trying to, so the first one is that he wants to receive praise through you. He wants, he wants to see his glory through you. Another reason is that he wants to perfect us in character. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, you can write that down. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10, all these points to us. They tell us that God is trying to build our character and God is trying to perfect us. Let's open to First Peter chapter 5. I think we're still in Peter. Peter has a lot of, had a lot of understanding of this trial. First Peter 5, 10, he said, But the God of grace, God of all grace, who had called us unto this eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, it will do what? It will make you perfect. It will establish you. It will strengthen you. It will settle you. So daughter, son, are you seeing why God is trying you? Because he wants to perfect you. Because he wants to establish you. Because he wants to strengthen you. And he won't stop. No matter how much we cry. No matter how much we trouble him. Some people that came out of the fire abruptly, their lives have been wasted. Most of them have wasted in hell. Most of them, they are the ones making the, making the name of the Lord be in vain. See them ministers with gifts. No life. And they are putting the name of God in, in shame. And you, when you browse the internet, you see all of them on the internet. But God doesn't want you to make people despise his name. He wants to bring out the best in you. So that's the purpose of trial. I'll quickly run through the next. Oh, my time is... <laughs> on the other hand, so let's look at temptation. Temptation, I told you, is the negative part. So it's God who is trying us. And then temptation. Temptation is an inducement, an enticement to sin. And in James chapter 1, it's very clear there that God cannot tempt us. God cannot be tempted, neither can he tempt anyone. James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. He said, let no man say, sister, don't say, brother, don't say, when you have been tempted. He said, don't say I'm being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, Neither does it tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lust and enticed. And then in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, it tells us so clearly there that Satan is the tempter. So Satan, through your thoughts, through enticing you with the little things of this world, with bread, with clothing, with housing, husband, wife, family, son, daughter, and all these things is tempting us. So I told you Pierre Azo, that's two of them, the same Greek word, but in different contexts. So when the devil is being the one trying you, 
he, he always has an evil intention to make you fall. When the purpose of a test is to make the person fail the test, you are the devil. But when the purpose of the test is to prove the person, if all you have been teaching the person, the person has been understanding it, that's a test and that's godly. So can you see now, so every one of us will be tempted. Jesus was tempted. And even in Matthew chapter 4, he told us that Jesus was sent, led by the Spirit. In 4 verse 1, Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness, perhaps to get tried. That's Jesus being led by God. That's the Spirit into the wilderness. That's his own wilderness. Now, that's his own trial. In the wilderness, there's no water there. There's no bed there to lie down. He has to lie on the very sharp sand. And so you, you can see that God actually pushed him to be tried. But also, the devil now came there also to tempt him. Are you seeing it now? So everyone will be tempted. If Jesus was tempted, you and me. In fact, in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights, the temptations here, they only narrated the ones that happened after the 40 days. What about the ones that happened during the 40 days? Or maybe you thought the devil was afraid of Jesus not to have tempted in 40 days. Even in the midst of your fasting, the devil will come and tempt you. So what's temptation? When a thought flies into your mind, have you sinned? No, temptation is not sin. But when you fall into temptation, that is when it's sin. Just that James, I think let's read it well so that we can understand when it becomes sin and you have been tempted. Uh, let no man say, so, but 14, I say, but every man who is tempted, when he's drawn away, that's the temptation. And that, 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 that's the sin now, because you have been drawn away of your own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is sin, it bringeth forth death. So temptation could be like a thought flashes to your mind. What you do of it determines whether it's a sin or whether it's not a sin, because temptations will always come. When, even in the midst of prayer, some pornographic picture, maybe you were on the road, you just saw a billboard and it was something naked, it, it sticks to the camera of your brain. And when you're in the midst of prayer, you just see a picture like that, that's not sin. That's temptation, the devil brought it to your mind. So what you do when temptation comes is what determines whether it's a sin or you're still having victory. So, but if you accommodate it in your heart, if you allow it to conceive, when the picture comes to your mind, and you begin to admire it, and you begin to accommodate it. If you conceive it. When a woman is conceived, there's something inside of her, and it is growing. So when you allow the temptation, the picture, the evil, the anger, to grow inside of you, that is when it becomes sin. So uh, the purpose of temptation is always to make us fall. The devil wants to make us fall. So, but why, what's the major cause? What are the, why do people fall into temptation? Why, why, why is it that despite all the warnings in scripture, why is it that we still see ministers? Why is it that we still see people falling into temptations? In Luke chapter 8, the Lord tells us there, I'm trying to be very, very fast because I know my time is running fast. Uh, in Luke chapter 8, I'll read 6 and 13 so that we'll see Luke chapter 8. Okay, you see verse 6 says, And some fell, that's talking about the sower and the seed. And some fell, the sower was going, and then it, some of the seed in his hand fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. So, what's the law? What's the interpretation? That's Luke chapter 8, verse 6 now. I'm going to get in. He said, Then on the day on the rock, he started interpreting the parable from 5 to 6. Parable started five to eight, then interpreted it from 10 to 13. So the parable for the interpretation for verse six is 13. He said, then they on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no roots, which for a while believe and in time of temptation, they fall away. Why do we fall into temptations? Because the roots, the seed there signifies the word of God. And when the word of God does not sink inside of us, when it just comes on your heart, you are joyous. Oh, I've heard something very powerful today. This brother spoke so well. This brother spoke. It, it enticed you. You were so joyous. You were so happy about it. But you did not allow the word. You did not meditate on it. You did not allow it to go deep down. Because when you plant a seed, and the, the, the ones that will grow so quickly are those ones who just put on the, on the soil, and then you see them just sprout quickly. Before you know, when, when the sun comes up, the bad weather comes up, you just see them, they just dry up. But those ones that go deep, 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 when it falls, you see the, the, the seeds, the roots will get moisture. 
Are you getting it? So that's why uh, when you hear the word, what are you supposed to do with the word? You allow the word to sink inside of you. You allow the word of God to take effect. You allow it to go deep into your spirit. You meditate on it. And when temptations come, those words you've meditated, they'll come to you. And then you begin to you begin to speak them, just like Jesus overcame temptations. He started rebuking. It is written. It is written. How can you say it is written? Is it just by cramming? No. It has to come from your spirit. It's not even quotation of scripture. Did Jesus say it says in Matthew chapter six and six? It, there was always he had already sunk himself. He had allowed the word of God to go deep into his bones, allowed the word of God to go deep into his spirit, so that when temptation now came, the appropriate scripture to that temptation, he quoted it. Are you going to wait until the temptation comes from the devil before you now quote the word? Scripture, or you begin to call pastor, or you begin to call brother, this, this, I saw this. I, you must have fallen before you know how to now escape it. So, but for us to be, uh, to still stand, for us to be able to overcome temptation, God is admonishing us today that we should allow his word to have root in our spirit. Allow his word to sink deep down and bear fruit inside of you. So another reason why people fall into temptation is that they don't watch and pray. In Luke in Luke chapter 22, verse, that's Mark 14, 36. Mark 14, 38. Mark 14, 38. He said, watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray. The Lord is admonishing us, watch and pray. Many people who don't watch and they don't pray. What does watch mean? Watch means to keep awake, to be spiritually alert. And also to pray. So if people who don't watch, who they are not sensitive, they can easily fall into temptation. When the Bible says, lead us not into temptation, it's not as if the Lord is leading you into temptation. It only means, let us not fall into temptation. Do not allow us to fall into temptation. So for you not to fall into temptation, the Lord is admonishing you today, watch, be observant. Be sensitive in your spirit. You are moving on the road wherever you are. Listen to the Spirit of God in you. In John chapter 8, verse 6, we see the, the scenario of the, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, and she was brought to Jesus. What should we do to her? Let us kill her. The law says anybody caught in adultery must be killed. And you are a holy person. We know you are from God. What do you want us to do? If you are like, if, if you were in Jesus' shoes, some of you must have said, oh yeah, leave her alone. You are oh, disobeying the law. Or some of you must have said, oh yeah, kill her. A legalist. So what did Jesus do there? Jesus listened. As he was writing on the ground, he was listening to the Spirit. He said, Father, what do you want me to say in this situation? The devil is trying to tempt me. He's trying to make me fall. He says, what do you have for this situation? My husband just spoke harshly at me. My, my children, they are disobedient. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? My boss is trying to tempt me. What do you want me to do? You are always listening to the Spirit. And as he was writing on the ground, the Holy Spirit ministered to him and gave him what to say. Whoever has not sinned among you. You know, he did not go on any side. He only gave them the question, if whoever has not sinned among you should throw the first stone. He did not say they should not throw it. Neither did he say they should throw it. Because they, whichever side he went to, he, must, he would have been disobedient. So you must be sensitive in the spirit if you overcome temptation. And also in 2 Timothy 2, 22, through the spirit of God, Paul was admonishing Timothy. He said, flee. There are some things, especially male, there are some things we must flee from. It is not when you are in the midst of temptation, you begin to pray and say, Lord, maybe so a, girl, a lady is trying to seduce you in your office, and then you are saying, uh, you are speaking in tongues. Lord, help me out of this situation. I cast away. You run. You run for your life. So there are times when you pray, when it is a temptation in your thoughts. You cannot run away from your thoughts. But when it's your boss in your office, and he locked the door. Try as much as possible to scream and shout. You cannot pray there. Your prayer, you just give it this love, and he will do whatever he wants to do with you. So there are some times you need to flee. There are some times you need to be wise. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus Christ. So is God actually with us when we are being tempted, or he just allow the devil to keep tempting us and keep tempting us, keep pressurizing us? No, he's always there with us. In First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he's there with us. Though he's not the one tempting us, but he allowed the devil to do it because he had a walk. Temptations also have a work in our lives. Uh, let us know that 10, 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, said, therefore, have no temptation taken you. No temptation. Mm. 
Also, no trial, no temptation. No matter the temptation you are facing, brother, sister, wherever you are, in any part of the world, no temptation has taken you that is not common to man. That has not happened to somebody before. But who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able to bear? Even in trial, he will not allow you to go through what you are not able to. So whenever you are in some certain situation and you are like, God, this problem is too heavy for me. I tell you, just go back to the scripture. It's a lie. God cannot lie. Whatever problem you are, it can never be heavier than your strength. So long as you're a child of God, God cannot bring or allow the devil, in fact, to bring whatsoever temptation that he has not put in you the enablement to overcome. God will only allow temptations that he knows that he has given you the ability to overcome, to come towards you. Certainly. So why do we fall? Because we, not, we do not follow God's word. We do not allow God's word to sink in our hearts. We do not listen to the voice of the Spirit. Don't go into his office. Don't go into his office. Your boss is calling you. Don't, go into, don't pass through this road, road at night. You didn't listen. You went there and you were, you, you were tempted and you fell. If we keep God's word, we would not fall. Galatians 5.16 says, Be in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is not possible. The lust of the flesh will keep coming. Temptations will keep coming. Whether you are, on, you are on fasting for 14 days or you are on fasting for 21 days, even after your 21st day of fasting, the devil will tempt you. He is not afraid of coming close to you. Your holiness does not stop the devil from coming to your family and appearing in your dreams. No, no matter how holy you are. He does not come to, he does, he does not come because he still goes to God's throne and God permits him. Till today, the devil still has access to God's throne and God permits him to still come and tempt us. So it's God permitting him, not even you. So when he comes, are we ready to face him? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, he also said that Jesus was tempted at all points. All points. Maybe because Jesus was just 33 years, and some of you here, you are 50, 40 something, you say, Jesus, I had more experience than you did. You maybe did not face this particular one. And Jesus was a man, so he did not face what women are facing today. The temptation to wear this, the temptation to Jesus was not, Jesus was tempted at all points. All the principles. If it's about losting over garments, he was, he, was, he was tempted to lust against the opposite sex. If it's about the garments to wear, he was tempted in every respect. The Bible will not say in every respect if it was not in every point. So Jesus was also tempted at every point. What happened? He overcame. That is an assurance that God will not bring a temptation to you that you were not meant to overcome. So my brothers and my sisters, God is admonishing us today. Even in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it tells us that he would deliver us from those temptations. He has seen us in those temptations. But as he seen you, and the devil is trying to push you here, push you there, push you here, push you there. And the devil is coming to take you out of that fire. It's coming to take you out of that, that, that oppression of the wicked. So if you endure temptation, is there a reward? Yes, in James 1, verse 12, it tells us that those who overcome, those who endure temptations, we receive the crown of life. All these scriptures, you can write them down and look it up yourself. And then all through the all through Revelations, Revelation chapter two, Revelation chapter three, it says, "Those who overcome, those who overcome, those who overcome, will get the crown of life. Those who overcome will get the living water. Those who overcome, the Lord is looking for overcomers. No, God will not say overcome when He knows that." Come. There's nothing to overcome when I don't bring obstacles. There's nothing to overcome when I don't bring persecution. There's nothing to overcome when I don't bring temptations. So when if God is saying overcome, he's trying to tell you that something is going to come your way. And very simple and short. So those who overcome will receive the crown of life. My brothers and my sisters, do not be discouraged. Do not be caught here and there. Do not think your problem is bigger than you. Your problem can never be bigger than you. First Peter chapter 11, chapter 1, verse 11, let's see another assurance that when we are going through trials, when we are going through, uh, when we are going through any temptation, First Peter chapter 1, verse 11 speaks another thing. He said, searching that, searching what, or what manner of time the split Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it is testified beforehand, the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Peter was telling them here that it had been testified that Jesus was going to suffer and that glory was going to follow his suffering. After your suffering, there is a glory. So brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord is speaking to you today. No matter the challenge, no matter the trouble you are facing, after the suffering, 
after the temptation, whatsoever you are facing, there is a glory coming up after. So um, I'll quickly rush with five minutes now so that I can give about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, persecution. Persecution is another form of trial. But now the difference between persecution and trial is that God is the one trying us. And now persecution is that God is infusing or trying to use men to harass, to oppress, to injure, to punish, or even to put us to death. That is persecution. When God uses man, or when the devil uses man, this time it does not come. It's not in your thoughts. It can, it can tempt you in your thoughts. It can come to you, uh, maybe your family, your, 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 your son says something or does something, and it tempts you to be angry at him, and all these things. Those sons are temptations. But now persecution is when he allows your husband to lay his hands on you because you are reading your Bible, or because you are calling the holiness church, or because you have represented Christ, or maybe you're in a country where they don't allow them to preach in the public, and they catch you and they put you in the cell. All those ones are persecution. So, but Christ is admonishing us today. But persecution will always come. Persecution is not is different from when you do something and then they flog you because when you go and steal and then have people say, "Oh, Jesus, I'm being persecuted." That is not persecution. When you do evil and you have been disciplined for your evil, that is not persecution. But persecution is always for the sake of Christ. In Matthew chapter four seventeen, persecution for the sake of Christ. Matthew chapter thirteen verse thirty one for the sake of Christ. Galatians 6, verse 12, for the sake of Christ. In Acts chapter 5, you see the disciples, Peter and the rest, they were, they were bundled because they were found preaching in the temple. And they bundled them and they put them somewhere and they were flogging them and flogging them. He said, we have told you not to preach this gospel. We have told you not to, for the sake of Christ, they were preaching. And then they flogged them and after flogging them, they released them. That is persecution. And what was their response? God is speaking just not to tell, equip our head with all these things. He's trying to tell us that these things will come our way. We must react to them wisely. What was the reaction of Peter when he was persecuted? He said they rejoiced. Even in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, they will get the kingdom of God. Those who are killed, those who are beaten, those who are grieved, oppressed, because they have held on to Christ, they will receive the reward. So who will, who will persecution come to? Everyone. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it tells us, everyone who will live godly in Christ, if you don't want to live godly, if you don't want to preach the word of God, if you just want to be born again and you sit in your home, nobody will persecute you. So there's no problem. But everyone who wants to live godly in Christ must suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. You must. It's a must. Except you don't want to live godly in Christ. And you don't want anybody to know you're a Christian wherever you're staying. If you must live godly... The Lord says you must suffer persecution. Also in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it also tells us that as a soldier of Christ, you must suffer persecution. So what is God trying to tell us? Is he trying to scare us with all these things? Every of these things has a designed and a defined purpose before the throne of heaven. God wants to, through these things, mold us. Was Jesus tried? Yes, he was tried. All through his 30 years, the hardship in his family, the, 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 the black semen from people, the, the, the difficulty. Joseph, pay my school fees now. The father will say, oh, you, no customer. And perhaps he dropped out. When he's playing football, look at this bastard. Trials and temptations. Even in the heat of fasting, 40 days and 40 nights, the devil followed him there and he was tempting him with lust, with evil desires, with food, with housing, with clothing. It came to Jesus. And then, did they persecute Jesus? Yes. They called him devil. With all the miracles, you can imagine all the miracles Jesus did. Sometimes he could not even combat anybody from a whole multitude. Why? Because of they are hiding their heart. So do not be discouraged, my brothers and my sisters. God is looking at you. The suffering of this present time in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, cannot be compared to the glory that God is bringing out of your life, that God is bringing out of my life. So do not be discouraged. Just like I told us, illustration of the gold, how it is being refined, and the silver. The fire is very intense. The fire is very hot. But God is concerned. The refiner is more concerned about the impurities. He said, these impurities, I want them to be burnt off. I want them to be burnt off. 
the silver smith had to sit down and keep watching this, this silver until he sees his image in the silver. So also God is looking at you. It's not perhaps laughing at your persecution and laughing at your tribulations and laughing at the temptations the devil is bringing towards you. Rather, he's sitting and watching. What would my son do? After Prime 2, the promoted to Prime 3, promoted to Prime 4, God wants to promote us in every ramification until we become exactly like Jesus. He would not stop testing us. He would not stop allowing the devil to tempt us. Neither will he stop allowing people to persecute us. I pray the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. So uh, let me give room for questions now because I know the time has 10 minutes more. So please, if there are questions, if we can answer them, you know, the, are we all here? Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are here, sir. Everybody get to all the points and the rest. Okay, okay. okay. So please, if you have questions, is there any question you want to ask? You want to ask, how can we know if it's a temptation, if it's a trial, whatever question, please, can we put it for before, before one o'clock? Okay, let's say uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, uh, okay, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's let's look at Matthew five, Matthew five twenty eight. Uh, Matthew five twenty eight. Okay. And, uh, I know that I'm speaking because we are trying to press on to perfection. So look at what he says here. He says, um, "What I say unto you." That will say ever look at on a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. And because I don't have to do that, if you went to uh, you have done nothing wrong. Uh, but that's why we say Jesus now came to fulfill all and he came to perfect all and all the rest. So now um as touching this speech, um, and you say you, you were saying something about us like um, and that it's really acts of one day, uh, possibly that you sin against God. Right. So, from Matthew 5 to 8, now is that sin, that sin is lost God. The praise God. Okay, what, what does lust mean? Lust means a strong desire. Lust in itself is not even sin because I can lust after God. I can say I have a strong desire. I, can, I am lost, as in I'm lost in the love of God. So, lust in itself, that word lust is not sinful. Because it just means a strong desire towards something. Now, it is now towards what that determines whether it is sinful or it is not sinful. So now, when you say look at, there's a difference between looking at something and just seeing it. Something comes to your, just maybe a billboard, and they put a naked picture for them. And you just see it, and the thing comes to your heart. If you do not desire what has come to your heart, you have not sinned. Because you must be tempted. So when you now have a strong desire, you are now ruminating over what has come to your heart. And now begin to think about it, say, oh, how I wish, how I wish. Maybe the only opportunity that you did not uh, lie with that person was that there was no room. Or perhaps you are afraid of your reputation or you are afraid that people will see you. That is now lost. Not that something accidentally comes to you and then it triggers your spirit. What your response to everything that comes to you is what determines it. If it comes to you and then you rebuke it in the name of Jesus, and you have no, even your, your body organs might respond to it, even as male, your body organs might respond to it because the flesh always lost. No matter what, but your heart determines whether you have allowed it to conceive inside of you. So whosoever looked at a woman and what? So lost after her. You look at that woman, she's on skimpy dress, or even she's dressing holy. And then you look at her and you keep gazing at her and then you are you have even stripped her naked while she's dressed. You have you have fornicated with her. So that's what the scripture means. So let us not let us not take it beyond how it is. There is nobody, even Jesus, while he was interviewing female, he did not get married. While he was interviewing, his body organs will stimulate. Because Jesus was flesh and blood. Even as a male, you are a female, you are speaking to a female body from your body organs. But when you now rebuke it and try as much as possible to flee away from such environment, the Lord has seen that you are faithful and you've not sinned. I don't know if I answered that question. Did I answer it? Let's, let's, uh, let's get one or two contributions on that also. Um, I'm about to get a contribution on that. Uh, okay. Um, 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I just want to add to what uh, Brashuk said, you know, about uh, refining us as a gold. You know, if you look at the book of are you hearing me? Sorry. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah, we can hear you, sister. Um, praise the Lord. Let's finish, let's finish this other question then before we go to the refining as well. Okay, so the contribution I had for that one is um, about lusting, what I can see. It's the fact that, okay, so we will always be tempted. You will look around you, there's always something to tempt you. But the fact that you contemplate on that thing, you know, if you don't miss it immediately from your mind, but you let it, you know, you process it in your mind and you let it stay, linger around. You let it linger around in your mind and you say, oh, how I wish I could have this thing. Oh, how, you know, just think about it, relish it. If you relish it for just one more second, you have seen. So the temptation will be there. You look around, you see a woman who's scantily dressed. You look around, you see something you desire. Oh, how I wish I had that car. How I wish I had that house. If you, that how I wish. Oh that, oh, that thing is so beautiful. You know, and you start imagining it to be yours. I believe that is what is the sin. The sin is about letting it stay in your mind. But if you dis dismiss it because it will always be everywhere. Temptations will be everywhere. You dismiss it immediately. Or you say, okay, that woman is fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, like they are properly dressed. There's no part being, you know, that is uncovered in their body. And you say, okay, God has created a very wonderful creature. You give the glory to God instead of giving the glory to the creature that God has made. I think those are ways of uh, avoiding sin. And praise the Lord. Um, Hallelujah. There's there's a, there a reason, you know, why I'm I'm, I'm asking this. Um, Sister Kukube, you still make your contribution, but is as touching this question on you. you no. Know, in this Matthew five twenty eight, why Jesus was trying to um, prepare the scripture was because of one thing. You know, there is, a, there, is, there, is, there is a way God looks at the heart and you are not opportune to do something all the rest. There is a difference when I see a billboard and you see something make it immediately because I think now this thing is trying to bring a benchmark. It, it, it has to do with a split of seconds. What I'm trying to say is that there is a difference when somebody sees something. You see, um, you see a naked picture or, you know, maybe um, on TV and all the rest. And immediately, that split of seconds, you didn't even waste one second. You just said, I rebook you, get away from my side. And there's a difference when you see something, at least in the split of one, two seconds, you look at it. But you have no opportunity inside of you. And... What I'm trying to say, I'm trying to be very much critical and go deep. It says that God is looking at that first desire. And I, I must say this, and I. Inside of the heart of so many, most of no opportunities to do that thing. So they basically just shiver away. And yet, after then, you know, I'm, I'm thinking and um, more of a contribution and presentation. No, they are not together. The split of seconds that you waited, you know, and just entered inside of your being and all the rest. That's. Um, I think time, time is almost up, but one thing I have to say again, can we hear me? Yes, can we sir. Hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, one thing I have to say is that let us not legalize it, because let us not make it legalistic in the sense that you put a standard that is impossible to yourself. When the devil tempted Jesus with food, did he desire food? It was food. No. Did it, did it, as in, was it... Did, was it if you consider split second, the thing is about letting it to conceive before you can conceive something, before you cannot begin to admire and desire that it. Don't tell me that your flesh you must stimulate. 
Don't tell me that your heart will not shake like this. But when you allow it, are you getting this? So you can, because a small believer, you, that person will just keep crashing. Because if you tell the person that just that second, there is nobody that can spare that first second. But God is always looking at allowing it to come. It's not born in one second. Or it's not conceived in one second. Are you getting it now? So you must take coming out of your flesh will stimulate. But your heart that is always stick to God will reject it. So it is when your heart now accepts it that it becomes sin. So but when you begin to take cognizant on one second, two seconds, you are not beginning to make a law. All these things you, you put so much uh, uh -huh. so but you will know when you have sinned because if you have the spirit of God in you, it will tell you if you have sinned or not. Are you getting it now? So let us not uh, overstress the, the whole matter because you might put up a standard now, somebody will always be feeling guilty all through the years and all through the days. But I think God even works with us in different ramifications. Some some kids, sometimes you will not you will not slap your child because he eats sand, because you know he's already he's still a kid. But the higher you go, perhaps the ministry and an anointing, any small thing you do, the Lord rebukes you immediately and you must you must you must uh, uh, confess and repent of your sins. I'm not trying to say we should accommodate sin. In fact, one second of sin is not important. But what transcends what makes lost to go into sin is that you allow your heart to enjoy it. You allow your, your, your heart to accept what your flesh is bringing forth to. So that's just uh, the simple something. Yeah, so uh, Sister Kokube, can you give your... Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But it, it's almost that. What I want to say is that, like when he was explaining now, how to go through the fire to be refined and everything, because that is how our Lord Jesus wants us to pass through. Because if we are not being refined through his own fire, we'll not be able to overcome when trials and temptation come. Because if we are not refined, according to the book of Revelation 3.18, he said we will, we will, we will see him in, um, in, in nakedness and shame. But if we are being refined through him, if he personally refine us, allow him to refine us, all those things we will not see them. The shame and nakedness will not see. That means, in my own understanding, is that that shame and nakedness is hell. If you're not refined, if you don't allow God to refine you, you will go to hell. But if you allow God to refine you, then you'll be able to see him. If you go down to 21, he said, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me. So if we are being refined through his fire, that means we have overcome and we'll be able to see him and sit with him on his throne. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wow. This is a, this is a very interesting topic. I, I think if we are allowed to continue this topic next <laughs> next Sunday, that would be really great. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, if that will be permitted. Okay, praise the Lord. Um, it is time to round up the discipleship class now so that the Sunday service can start, the worship service can start. Praise the Lord. Uh, let, us, let us just say a quick prayer. I, I don't believe we have time for the monthly declaration and other things. Um, Father, we thank you for this session of the word that has come from Lord God Almighty. We pray, O oh Lord my God, that this word will bear fruit in our hearts, in the hearts of the viewers, and in everybody to understand that temptation. Father, Lord God, that we should not allow it, O oh God Almighty, to become sin. In the name of Jesus, we need your grace. Father, Lord, give us the grace. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Um, let us just share the grace in fellowship real quick. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, with us now and forevermore. Amen. And let us please remain in the meeting room as the worship service will be very same. Praise the Lord.